Speaking of advanced hull design, we have a couple of naval architects up here with us. So, um, Jeff, maybe you'd like to uh, tell us a little bit about what you're seeing from, from the naval arc side. Okay, good. So, uh, the hybrid technologies, right? And so, um, I want to draw a distinction right up front and, and draw the, uh, the compare and contrast cars versus boats. I mean, we've already talked about uh, a boat takes ten times more power. Well, that's because, you know, water is a thousand times more dense than air. And the physics behind a car moving in air and accelerating on the freeway is completely different than the boat. So the car uh, will accelerate up through the gearbox, uh, you know, you'll have um, one, two, three, four gears, and you're trying to maximize your torque so you can accelerate quickly, but once you achieve that speed, you lift on the throttle, right? We all know that. You, you, you push on the accelerator to get to 65 and then you lift up. A lot less power is required to maintain that speed. Uh, and then a car has brakes, which a boat doesn't have. So the car pushes on the brakes, uh, you engage the electric motors, and they become generators and recharge the battery packs, right? So that's what we call energy harvest. Um, boats, you don't have that scenario. A boat, you push the throttle down, you very slowly accelerate. Sometimes you're questionable if you'll get over a hump, as an example, right? Um, and then you'll finally achieve that speed, and you'll leave the throttle there at 85% in CR, sucking down diesel fuel, um, so the, 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 the engine never has that opportunity in most recreational boats to unload uh, and therefore be able to go through the hybrid cycle where a little bit of electric boost power will help or um, uh, get you to the end. You know, some technologies or some applications in the marine world, since we work on both recreational, commercial, and military vessels, uh, do see some added benefits from, from hybrid uh, type power plants. Um, you'll see those um, in basically tugboats is a great example because they just need a little extra boost of power every now and again to push up against that ship and that's where that electric battery comes into place and uh, supports the electric motor which also turns the drive shaft with the diesels so you can get a boost like that and by putting that type of technology into that boat you reduce the overall load cycle it's called peak shaving uh, and you get an uh, engine which operates in a more sp uh, efficient range Jeff, just speak into the mic a little bit uh, more Even directly. More. How's that? Much better. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, good. So, um, so the hybrid stuff, uh, you know, has limited application in my mind, but there is a drive towards it. You know, um, I really think that the. Uh, all electric boats or even um, you know some type of modern real clean propulsion system I've been a proponent of of compressed natural gas for years because of the low uh, soot uh, that's actually in the fuel uh, when you burn it um, but the hybrid uh, sorry hydrofoil technology is I think something that really can and will show a benefit you can see uh, products out there with Candela uh, and Artemis as well as other uh, manufacturers um, Hydrofoil is not new, right? We had naval craft that had hydrofoils back in the 70s, um, and that technology was great, but those were big ships, and it required gas turbine engines to push them, and they were highly fuel inefficient, and so therefore um, the Navy got rid of them. But at a smaller scale, like we're seeing now with 8 to 10 meter pr platforms, and with the idea that you know 20 knots is enough as opposed to trying to drive to the edge of foil technology which is about 45 knots the as soon as you get to 45 knots the foils will cavitate and then the drag goes through the roof and you can't push them any faster but um, at a nice moderate 25 knot speed uh, you can get excellent reduction in resistance uh, when you put them on uh, a hydro platform so um, there's a lot of enabling technologies that talk to that, right? So one of them is high energy density batteries. We've already talked about lithium ion batteries a little bit. Uh, they're great, um, but uh, as Martin said, you know, the technology will never get there for um, boats. You've got to have something that's different. We're looking, uh, there's a, a program out there by the Department of Energy. Uh, I think it's one, one kilo, kilowatt per kilogram, uh, and that's set up to be a metric of what they're trying to get in novel energy density uh, storage energy density of storage systems, right? So they're looking to have something that's um, far greater than what any type of electrical storage device today produces. So whether that be ammonia, whether that be hydrogen, whether it be powdered aluminum and some chemical reaction and basically drop in replaceable fuel cells, right? So you'd have a canister with powdered aluminum, you might drop it in, there's a chemical reaction, you've got the energy to do what you need to do. Uh, but that'll be far different from, um, from the electrical capability that's out there today. 
And then carbon fiber is a great example. Um, you know, being a boat guy and a go fast guy, um, I like to keep the boats light. And uh, from that perspective, what carbon fiber has introduced in terms of strength uh, and low weight is fantastic. But again, you know, carbon fiber is extremely energy intensive to produce. And one of the professional boat builder articles from earlier this year. They talked to a, what was it, a standard 60-foot uh, racing sailboat. The carbon dioxide um, emissions of associated with that product has increased 50% in the last 10 years, in the last decade, just because now everything on the boat's carbon fiber instead of FRP. So that shows you that these enabling technologies that are out there are great in what they can do for performance sometimes, but um, we got to remember that they might not be sustainable or renewable. Uh, so what might look great on the surface, if you scratch a little deeper, you might find something a little different. We have, you know, North America is one market, uh, one regu regulatory environment. We're lucky to have Marnix with us who can speak to naval architecture in a very different environment uh, working in Europe. What, what do you see in Mar Marnix? Yeah, it's quite, it's quite, um, it's quite interesting to, uh, to see when we prepare this as well, is that you approach this really also from a regu regulatory point of view and a lot of analysis, where uh, if, you, if you go to my, uh, I think it's the third slide, where we are less structured, maybe organized, whatever, uh, the one before, yeah. And so for us it's much more, it's an open and it's a free market, I guess. And so the first thing I want to get across from my side of the, of, the, of the world is that we very much decided that sustainability should not be some kind of a political dilemma or, uh, you know, something you, you have to sacrifice, luxury or, or whatever, or that we have to get regulators involved. I think it's a massive design challenge, it's a massive design opportunity. We have, as naval architects designers, the chance to inspire our owners, design other products, come up with other ideas at the core of the beginning of any, any product. So that's, that's what we do, and I completely concur with everybody here on, on, uh, on stage. The great thing about this is that it kind of needs our work, because there's no single solution. There's no single answer. There's no golden bullet, whatever, to this point. So we need to analyze operational profiles, how do you want to use the boat, long, slow, uh, across Atlantic, and every time you come up with different solutions, which is awesome because it means I get, get to design cool boats and much cooler ones than I did ever before. So um, I brought a couple of, of examples um, of stuff which is, which is actually happening. So instead of talking about what could we do, yes, you showed that. What could we do? Uh, these are boats in, in uh, the water. So no need to, to go through all of them, but top, uh, top left is a whole new range of full electrical boats for Group Benito. Um, we're developing for them as they are responding to this new marketplace deciding they need to go uh, uh, greener, um, uh, life cycle analysis. Uh, the European Union definitely is coming with legislation uh, about how will you take end of life of this, of this product. So they're pushing their suppliers, which I am one of, <laughs> how are you going to help me make sure I actually have an end of, uh, end of life of this product? And they're coming out with these boats. Currently still with what they call a range extender, so it has, so to say, a little generator hidden in the, in the back running on fossil fuels, so at least charge the batteries. This is much to do with the fact that we don't have enough charging stations of these boats. So with them, we also entered into a, uh, a, a study with, uh, with local universities on, okay, how could we design charging stations and power those charging stations in a green way instead of charging them secretly with fossil fuel again, so our electrical boat isn't actually uh, green. Well, we got, you know, uh, one-offs, which, which happens a lot, you see there, all the way to, uh, to uh, hydrogen race boats, uh, um, which we're a big proponent of with getting students involved, up to governmental uh, uh, vessels. And that's interesting, I guess, to, to mention as well. I don't know if that happens a lot stateside, but at least in Europe, there's a lot of governments who, who try to influence um, this innovation by writing tenders and only full electrical or less environmental harmless vessels can be applied. And with that, they're trying to get the manufacturers and the rest of the industry to build vessels for them, which are you know, less harmful. And therefore, the next vessel they will build as a pleasure craft equally could have the same, uh, the same technologies. Um, yeah, maybe the, the last slide before is, is uh, one of, uh, indeed, uh, you know, the, the solar racing, which now slowly gets into the United States as well. So what we do in Europe uh, since 2014, I think, or maybe 2012, is which students write challenges uh, on, on, uh, on, on duration of races, on uh, maneuverability, on 
kind of like they do with solar cars in uh, in Australia, if you've uh, if you've heard of it. So it's student teams having to develop solar, purely solar powered vessels. They can only take energy from the sun and have to raise them student team to student team, university to university, and that inspires the the young minds of this world, which are super much brighter than sorry guys, all of us <laughs> together. <laughs> you know, they actually know how to use AI. Um, uh, come up with these with these super cool boats, and uh, we've been a big proponent of that. Uh, you know, supporting that with these teams as well. So that's like a little introduction on uh, on our side of the pond. Uh, you know, I had conversations with the Department of Energy not that long ago, and uh, you know, explaining some of this to them, and their their reaction was, you know, gee, we never really thought about recreational boats. And I think there's a couple reasons for that. One is it's pretty small on the overall contribution to CO2, like we mentioned. So the priorities are put on other sectors. But we, we recognize the need to do a full life cycle assessment for our industry. So